is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 454. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line, all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, what's up, buddy? How it goes? Uh, things are good. Things are good. Uh, just get, having a lot of weird draft formats recently. You know, there's been... Uh, the Pro Tour Cube was on for like a week, and mm-hmm, now we're, mm-hmm. we're into chaos drafting. So mm-hmm. it, it's it's a kind of weird spot. Like the fact that the World Championships is going to have Dominaria is kind of funny because, yeah, well, I mean it's it's an old draft format though. It is a good one, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, I did a Dominaria draft on uh, Arena. I, I I've started streaming for Wizards. They uh, from Tuesdays. Uh, two to five Pacific, I'm going to be streaming for them. And uh, I did a Dominaria draft and it, oh my, it felt like going home, man. I, yeah. I was just like, this is so sweet. And then, yeah, I remembered that it's going to be part of the the world's competition as well. So weird to kind of take a step backwards, but it's such a sweet set. I guess I'm just glad to do it. Um, all right. So this show, we've got a level up show. We, we figured it was time to do one of these. And we're going to be talking about kind of a big picture uh, topic for Magic Community as it stands right now uh, regarding data and how to use it and how to not use it or when to not use it. So we're going to be going deep on that one. Uh, before that, though, we've got a whole bunch of stuff to cover here. So first things first, our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. That's the place to go for everything you need Magic related on ye old internet. That's right. Everything. You can find uh, supplies. You can find deck boxes and play mats and sleeves and all that kind of stuff. But also, if you need cards, you can get them there. Singles and sealed product alike. And while you're there, free content right on the front page of ChannelFireball.com. You can watch some of the best players in the world battle it out on videos or write about their deck. So you can get a sideboarding guide or a draft guide or an archetype guide. Uh, Again, from full-time professional Magic players right on the front of channelfireball.com. Please do check them out. Also, you can support the show via the Patreon, via patreon.com slash limited resources. And if you do, you will be eligible for the Patreon question of the week, which comes from another Louise. This is actually uh, Manowar Elves, if you've ever yeah. seen Manowar Elves in On chat. Twitch. Yeah, exactly. Great name. Uh, and Louise says... Uh, Hey, Marshall and Luis, uh, I wanted to ask about heuristics and uh, when not to rely too heavily on them. I find sometimes when I'm facing a complicated board state or a hand with many possible plays, I'll be tempted to fall back on a heuristic to help me make the decision like, for example, use as much mana as possible. However, using heuristics can often obscure more complex lines of play that would have been realized with more intense deliberation during the play. How do I avoid excessively using heuristics to uh, where I lose win percentage on more complex board states? Thanks for the content, both streaming and podcasting. Thanks, Luis, for the question. Good one. We did it. We did a show about heuristics, but this is a, this is a potential pitfall of knowing when to uh, to set a heuristic aside and instead you know invest a little bit more thought into to what you're going to do. So what, what Luis wants here is a heuristic about when not to use heuristics. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's exactly what he's asking for. Uh, uh, that's great. So it is actually tricky, and the, the kind of the way I think you want to look at heuristics is not follow this guideline. It's in broad strokes. This is what you should be looking to do. Uh, and yeah, I mean, in in some case, is it is correct. You, you've got to handle a bunch of different plays. And you're not sure, and use the heuristic of use up as much mana as possible. And I think that's a good one. That that is a really good tiebreaker. Um, trying to figure out how to avoid excessively using heuristics is really hard because the whole point of heuristics is they're supposed to help you in situations where you don't know exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. In general, I would say that uh. Combat-based heuristics are harder to craft and l- tend to be less y- applicable. Like if you went back and listened to our heuristics episode, we didn't touch on that, but it's really hard to know. You know, there's four creatures on each side. I think it's just all going to be unique. Like there's so many different factors that go into it, and that's part of why right. this game is so sweet. It's just really complicated. Whereas do I play my four drop on turn five, even though it's a little bit better than my five drop? Well, I'll play my five drop because I want to use up all my mana. That's usually a, a pretty valid play. Uh, one of the things that break that, of course, is like, if you don't have any cheap cards in your hand, you might as well just play the, the whatever is better this turn because it's not like you're double spelling next turn anyway most of the time. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess 
it's kind of a non-answer, but I, I would say that in general, uh, the more complicated a situation, the less likely you, you should fall back onto a heuristic. And think of heuristics more as tiebreakers than guides. Like they, they are tight. The, the more knowledge you have, the less you need to lean on heuristics. But heuristics help inform you when you, you you're having a trouble making a decision, or you're close, or or it's a it's a kind of a spot where you're unfamiliar with what's going to happen. And at that point, you can lean on heuristics. Like, wow, I really don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Well, best practice is say I should follow this guide. But in general, like, yeah, it would be better if every single play you made was not using heuristics, right? It's just right. That takes too long and is too exhausting. Yeah, I think for me, I I tend to use them um, in times when I feel like I can autopilot a little bit, like the first few turns of the game. Um, you know, there's a few considerations, but for the most part, you're playing lands and using up your mana on not too many choices. I tend to try to set them aside when I find myself uh, thinking a little bit harder about, oh, well, can I really use up all my mana here? And I'll be like, hold on a second, should I? And that's where I kind of set it aside. I'm pretty quick to to set aside uh, those type of those type of heuristics, but I think that they can really help out with the with the basic part as well. Um, it is difficult, Luis. I mean, this is this is not a trivial skill that you're asking about. Um, you know, Ben Stark talked about it on the special LR episode when he said stuff like, "Look, the eighty percent play." isn't really that difficult. Like if you understand the fundamentals of magic and you know all the rules and stuff, you're going to be able to come to that 80% conclusion, uh, you know, most of the time. But when you need to make the 10% or the 15% or the 20% play, you know, that's less obvious, that's, he said, that's what separates out, you know, these elite pros from like regular pros and regular pros from, you know, your, your local level pl players or whatever. Uh, so, don't don't feel frustrated, Luis, if you, if you're not, uh, you know, if if this is something that you're having a little bit of trouble with, because it is very difficult. All right, let's crack a pack. This one comes from um, Gar and Gwendolyn, who I met at the GP in LA last weekend. Thank you so much for the pack. You guys were great. All right, we've got Act of Treason. Didn't really come together in M19, did it? No, I I had I had high hopes for the Black Road Sacrifice deck, but I, I would not start with Active Trees, and I just don't think that deck got there. Yeah, me too. I mean, I saw the the gold uncommon, you know, kind of the signpost, and I thought, all right, this has a built-in sacrifice ability that doesn't cost mana. Active Trees is going to be good, but no, nah, it wasn't the case. You really do need a, a common and reasonably playable card that can sack stuff for free, right? Like we saw Vampire Aristocrat kind of being the linchpin for Active Trees and decks before. Uh, Daybreak Chaplain, one and a white, one three with lifelink. I like this card. I found yeah, Daybreak Chaplain fine. to be a strong addition to to most decks, not even just the most control or mid range decks. Not not as much the aggro deck, but yeah, I, I, I I wouldn't want to take it first pick. Scholar of Stars, three and a blue, three two. When it ETBs, you draw a card if you control an artifact. I do like this card. I tend to play it in my blue decks, but I again wouldn't pick it early. It's the kind of card where you wheel and you look, you're like, okay, I've got three artifacts. That sounds good to me. Yeah, close enough. Uh, Doom Dissenter, another card perhaps falling victim to the uh, the lack of sacrifice stuff, but it's a, the one in a black 1-1. One, one. When it dies, you get a 2-2 two, two zombie. It's, it's, fine. It's, a fine, it's a fine card, yeah. None yeah. of these cards are exciting, but they're all playable. Yeah. Same with this next one. Rocks Oracle, four and a green for a 4-2. When ATBs, you draw a card. It's fine. Yeah, the pizza delivery what? rocks. Pizza delivery. Man, that pizza looks so good, too. All right, here's a good card. Electrify. Three and a red for an instant. Does four damage to a creature. All right, there so, you go. I, I'm I, I'm never unhappy taking Electrify early. Yeah, that's a fine card. Uh, walking Corpse. One and a, one and a black for a 2-2 two, two zombie. No. Yeah. Snapping Drake. Three and a blue for a 3-2 flyer. Not better than Electrify, right? It is definitely not better than Electrify, though. It, it is yeah. better than a lot of these other like, kind of mid-range playables. Yeah, this guy we we both liked as a, a little bit underrated. A Gearsmith Guardian, five mana, three yeah. five. But if you've got a blue creature, he's five five instead. Uh, still not as good as Electrify, though, right? Nope, nope, nope. Uh, Gearsmith Guardian, I think I would put behind Snapping Drake and probably behind. Well, you see, see the, the tricky part about all these cards is you're almost never going to take them first pick. So it's not like oh, what's better, Gearsmith Guardian or Doom to Center? It's like. What's better, Gearsmith Guardian or Dues Center once I have these five other cards? So right. it, it's a little bit totally. contextual. Yeah, and it totally changes, of course, because if Gearsmith Guardian is your one colorless card in a sea of blue cards, well, it's actually quite strong there. Ooh, here's a card, Druid of the Cowl. One in a, one in a green for a 1-3, it taps to add green. I like Druid of the Cowl a lot. I, it's a great reason to be green. I would still just start with uh, Electrify. 
part of the, the the advantage of Electrify as well is that it's uh, something that you can splash for and good in like, you know, your blue black splash Electrify deck. Whereas Drew Lacal, you're never going to splash for it. It just doesn't work to splash uh, mana yeah. accelerates. It's close for me. I, I might even take the Druid. Let's see what else we got though. Gaspark Twins. 5GG for a 7-7 Trampler that can block an additional creature. I do a little like bit. Man. Uh, I do I like Mana Gaspark Twins. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's one of the reasons to to be like a green ramp deck, though it's kind of like a, a, a budget Palaka Worm, right? Palaka Palaka Worm is the one you actually... <laughs> It is exactly a budget pluck over in poor Gaspark Twins. But still, would you take a seven drop like this over an Electrify or even a Druid of the Cow? No, I would take both of those over this. I, I would rather make sure I have the Man Accelerants because, yeah, this is better to ramp into than a Colossal Dreadmaw, I think, by a little bit. But mm -hmm. I'd rather have a Druid of the Cow and a Colossal Dreadmaw than like a Gaspark Twins and like a Bristling Bull, like a mid-range creature. I'd rather have an Accelerant plus my hand. Agree. Um, Ether Shield Ar Artificer is our next card. That's the the four mana, three and a white for a three three. And uh, at the beginning of combat on your turn, target artifact creature you control gets plus two plus two and an indestructible until end of turn. Kind this of is the kind of card you use to fill out your deck, but it's not the place I'd start. This is part of the reason that M nineteen hasn't captivated me quite as much as some of these other sets. Is you just don't have the 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 linear decks with payoffs that you know we we mm -hmm. really like to see and. Like something like the Artificer here, it's not a reason to be in the Artifact deck, and you'll play it if you've got some Artifacts, but it, no, it doesn't really drive a whole deck by itself. It's not something I would advise for a spec game. Yeah, I agree. It, and its best friend, the Aerial Engineer, is next. Two blue-white for a 2-4, and if you got an Artifact, it gets plus two, plus so, and flies. I, I do like Aerial Engineer as well. I, I don't think you can take a, a gold card that's not even necessarily good in the decks where you would play that. Um over something Four. like Electrify or even Drew to the Cow. Now, interesting here, though, we do have in this pack Scholar of Stars, Aerial Engineer, Aether Shield Artificer, and a Gearsmith card. Yeah, we've, this is a good pack for Sealed. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder, like, I wonder if we, we if this is the situation where we gamble a bit and, and we a, take the Artificer and hope to wheel the Engineer or the Gearsmith Guardian at, or something like that. At that point, I would just take the Engineer. I think the, the payoff is higher. I'd rather have a 4-4 four, four flyer than... Uh, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like the Aerial Engineer has a higher chance of wheeling. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm being a dreamer there. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Um, okay. I, I, I would rather start with that, but I think I'm still just taking Electrify and just kind of seeing what happens after that. All right, we've got a rare... It's Death Baron. One Black Black for a 2-2 two, two Zombie Wizard that gives Skeletons... And other zombies you control plus one plus one and death touch. I think a few payoffs for that in this set. Yeah, skeleton archer the best one. Uh, I, I would definitely. I would not take death baron first though. I th I no, me that, neither. I think that you're, you're going to be you're going to be a lot happier just taking boring old electrify. You know, all reliable. Yeah. We do have stone quarry in the deck too, but that's not going to bump it. All right, take the removal spell. Turns out corset drafting is corset drafting. And there's a few nuances to it, but it's not ex extremely deep. Okay, let's get into our main topic here, Luis. So I've been uh, doing some reading lately, <clears throat> and uh, I noticed kind of a broader trend in in magic content and and shows, you know, shows and, and articles and stuff like ours that are aiming to help get you better at magic. And of course, that's what this whole show is about. And I noticed that there's a lot of data now, right? Uh, you know, the world has moved in that direction, generally speaking. Um, you know, companies like Google and Amazon and stuff have, and Facebook specifically, have really capitalized on data rather than products, right? Rather than selling a thing, they actually just give you stuff for free so that they can gather data about you as a consumer. And then they sell that data to companies who value that very highly. And that stuff has trickled down into the rest of our society as well. There's a lot of data-driven things out there these days. And I think that magic is one of them. I think that a lot of people have noticed that, hey, there, I, if I can gather a whole bunch of information about these cards and strategies and archetypes and matchups and all this stuff, it could help me be a better player. And I think they're right. Uh, I think that that kind of data uh, is wrought with pitfalls, though. And that's what we're going to be talking about here is how to interpret and use the data that you can get and when not to, because uh, just as important as anybody who's, you know, looked into this type of thing, studies, political studies, stuff like that knows that while 
Uh, data can be used very much to be informative. It can also be used very much to sabotage ideas or to uh, change somebody's mind in a direction that it wasn't originally intended. And that can absolutely happen in magic as well. So for the main topic today, we're going to be talking about using information to your advantage and understanding what you can get from it and what you can't. Um, so here's an example to kick things off, Luis, just to kind of set the stage. So let's say you and a friend are practicing for an upcoming tournament. You decide to crack some packs of the current set and play some sealed. You build a solid blue black deck and your friend has some grindy green black deck or whatever. Uh, you want to know what your win percentage is against the other deck. Well, what do you do? You start playing games, right? It's play testing. So you jam like 10 games and you record the results and you end up, let's say, winning seven of the 10 games. And then you note down that it is a 70% favorable matchup for this kind of deck and you move on to crack another sealed and keep on practicing. But the question comes up, what did you really learn about the matchup? Is that 70% a reliable number or is it even useful? And, you know, as I said before, nowadays you have a lot of information available to you. You can watch videos with some of the best players. You can listen to podcasts like this one. You can read intricate articles breaking down formats or go on the LRCast subreddit or Discord channels to talk about these things. You're pretty much inundated with information constantly if you want to be. Uh, but which of this information is actually useful, like actually changes your chances to win when you sit down and play, because let's be real here, that's what it's about. It's about taking the information and transferring that information to wins at the table. Like you're going to go play FNM this week. You can get told a whole bunch of things about the set, but what is going to happen when you sit down and you look across at the seven other players and you have the packs in front of you and you're about to open them? What information are you going to be able to use to help you actually win games? This is one of the reasons why we don't love pick orders here on limited resources, for example. Sure, they're interesting and they can make a great discussion topic and they can even be a useful tool uh, like to get somebody up to speed on a format who really doesn't know a whole lot about it. But they tend to fall apart after like three picks in a draft because, you know, you can't just simply say, well, this card's better than this one and I'll take it because it depends on what your deck is doing and what your deck needs and your curve and all these other things. So that would easily make you pick a card that was lower on the pick order scale, uh, you know, than you had it originally. And so it doesn't end up being this super useful thing for the long term. And what we want, of course, is for you to leave this show with actionable, useful information basically every time we do it. That's that's our goal, yeah. right? And, and that's what's tricky about level ups in general. Like I, I level, level up episodes a lot. I, I think them and my sunset and the sunset shows are my favorite. <laughs> the sunset because usually we're saying, <laughs> saying adios to a set that, uh, you know, at that point we, yeah. we're, we're ready, ready to move on to the next one. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I do think that uh, level ups, the, the challenge all is with them and the reason that they're interesting to me is – you, you, you're trying to take general theoretical knowledge, timeless knowledge, and make it actually useful because one of the, one of the things that I, that really drives us when we do the show, and, and sometimes we do better mm -hmm. than others, you know, I will admit that is we want at the end of the show, like you said, for people who listen to be like, how did this help me win more? How did this help me be better at magic? You know, and to some degree, maybe approach life better. And not every show is going to be equal on those fronts and not every show is going to have like, I think like an archetype or a set review episode is a lot more directly applicable because just we know what people are doing at the time. We can talk about it. A level up episode is harder because the idea is that this will just help you in general. And sometimes that is harder to tell when that, what that did, right? Like, like, the, right. like one of my all time favorite episodes is when we talked about heuristics and heuristics it does help to learn those things and it does help. But remember, even earlier this episode, we said in an ideal world, you wouldn't use them, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, That's true. Yeah. They're, they're stand-ins for when you don't know what to do. So it, even the episode, which I think was very cool, has this element to it where it's like, well, if, you know, how much better did we make someone? How much more are they? When it's more theoretical. Right. How much more are they going to be able to apply this or or how do you even apply this? So. What we're going to try to do today is look at basically what you can learn and how you can improve while playing, knowing that there's a lot of uh, very tempting data-based approaches that I don't think are actually useful. Yeah. And, and that's a big deal because I think that people just take it at face value, right? People hear something, you know, they like people love doing this in all sorts of realms where it's like, well, 
look at this. This is X percent of the field and this matchup is, you know, 57 percent. So therefore this. And it's like it, that is oversimplifying a lot of what's going on. It's it's making it a lot harder, I think, for you to, to, to actually make good decisions because, I mean, there's a reason people like lists. There's a reason people like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> top tens. There's a reason people like uh, easily kind of digestible pieces of information. And mm-hmm. when, when you look at something and, and you're like, okay, well, the average turn length in this format is 7.2, therefore what? And I don't. a lot of times it feels like people don't know the second part. They just say like, okay, well, here's some information. Here's some data. What are we going to do with that? And they just basically try to try to try to do something useful with it and, and often don't get that. Right. Right. And, and this ends up being one of the best, one of the biggest skill sets for a high level magic player is understanding the data that they have put in front of them, how to decipher it, how much weight to put on it. And as Luis just alluded to, when to ignore it, when to say, this doesn't actually practically affect me in any way. It doesn't help me learn from a big picture. It doesn't help me when I sit down at the table and I need to, to jettison it because it might actually lead you astray. So let, let's talk about some of the, the actual concepts, the meat of this. So the first one that I wanted to hit on, because partially this topic was inspired by our friend Frank Karsten and an article he wrote that I'm going to talk about in a second, which is sample sizes matter a lot, right? And this is one of the fundamental issues that we face as a magic community when it comes to data, which is that you cannot or will not get sample sizes that are reasonable to make solid conclusions from almost ever. So I'm going to give an example here uh, that that Frank put in an article that I'm also going to link to uh, in the uh, in the show notes. Um, you know, if we go back to my original scenario where you and a friend are sitting down to play some matches against each other, and your goal is to get statistically relevant data, right? You you want to be able to make a conclusion about what matchups are good or not based on the, who won or lost a certain number of matches. What would be your guess as to how many you need to play? Is it ten or twenty or fifty or a hundred? It actually is way more than that. According to this article that I just mentioned, if you wanted to get a 10% in order to detect a 10% win rate difference. So this is a big gap, right? Like that's basically a useless, like if, if, if you, if your, uh, conclusion was plus or minus 5%, like it could be a 10% swing in either direction. That's effectively not useful already, you would need to play 744 games. <laughs> yeah. 744 games. And if you want to get that difference down to 3.8%, so this is a much more reasonable, but still kind of you need to know the difference if it's 60% versus 54, right? Like that's a huge difference or uh, 56, I mean, that's still a big difference. You would need to play 5,426 games to get to that point, be, be, like basically, it's ugh. impossible. And and the thing is, <laughs> right. we're not even saying that you that you're gonna like. No one's gonna sit there and try to figure out whether their green black seal deck is uh, has what percentage they have against their friend's blue black seal deck. That's nonsensical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what you're trying, let's say, let's expand that out. Take one step back and do something that uh, sometimes, like my team has kept data right, where we have a spreadsheet and people put in uh, their match results. And I, I know a lot of individual people who do that too. And you look and you're like, wow, blue green's the best archetype because it wins 61% of its matches. And black green is the worst because it only wins 48% of its matches. And then you look and the sample size is like in the 50s. And you look at, <laughs> and you look at the, you know, this data that you're, you're talking about. And it's like, okay, this is plus or minus 8% <laughs> or plus or minus 10%. Mm-hmm. And right. Yeah, it looks like 10% is at 744. We're, we're talking way less than that. So all right. of a sudden it's like, no, blue green isn't 58%, it's 48 to 68%. <laughs> and so right. yes, the fact that we have seen one win 10% more than another deck means that it's most likely better or at least have a has a higher win percentage, but our confidence level just can't be that high. So, right. You you you're ending up in a spot where that's not useful data. Like it is it right. is not very useful data for you to say like let's say someone on Twitter posts I just went 9-0 with three different mono red decks. Mono red, mono red is great in this format. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that that information is worth zero. 
They just did, they no. just did go 9 0 with mono red, and that's especially, that's even like a more unique archetype, so it, it can kind of reward you for going outside the, the box a little. But it also doesn't mean that their, their deck is great, because yes, they maybe went 9 0, but it very easily could have been 6 3 or 5 4. The margins just aren't yep. that big on each side. No. And, you know, I wanted to bring this up not to highlight the idea of, of doing playtesting for limited on an archetype basis, but to say if you were to do that, that's how the numbers play out. Now apply this to other things that we also have very small sample sizes on. For example, playing with a card, right? Yeah. You, a lot of times – so look, some cards we as a community know will do the things that we want it to do. And this is based on communal experience that we've all gained together. A card like Lightning Strike or Lightning Bolt, right? A cheap card that can kill something that costs more and even has a flexibility to, to kill the opponent is a type of card – that we've all decided is good. And I don't think that we need a large sample size to figure that out. Now you would want to know how good it is within the context of a given environment, but think about a card that's a little more complicated or a little more edge casey or weird. How many times are you realistically going to get to play that card, Zero especially if it's a rare, <laughs> right? And you are going to have to make some type of conclusion based on that one time you got to play it or maybe played against it once and you played with it once or something like that. And you simply don't have the sample size to make a reasonable conclusion based on the results of how the card did. Now, we're going to talk in a little bit about the other things that you can pay attention to. And this is where we believe you should be focusing your energies. But if you're you know, trying to say, I played this card once and it was good, therefore it's good. Or even I played this card three times and it was good, therefore it's a good card and a high pick and all these things. This is where people get tripped up a lot because they can, they can. you do not have the information. I, I, right? I think it's important to drill down what you mean by this and what their, and what their, what experience are trying to relate mm -hmm. because saying like, yes, I believe it is. I believe it is very dangerous to say something like, uh, I took a desecrated tomb, right? The, the card that makes bats when you, a card leaves your graveyard mm -hmm. and I three owed with it. I think this card's good because this deck came together. That's dangerous because I think most people will look at it and be like, wait, so what did your deck look like? You're like, oh, you had five different uncommons that supported this theme. Okay. I don't really believe that that's, you know, a, a realistic thing or, I drafted a mill deck because I drafted two psychic corrosions and a patient rebuilding and had a very good blue black control deck alongside of it. That doesn't mean mill is good, even mm -hmm. though I actually do think it's good in this format. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other side of it, if if you have a card that is that looks kind of weird, I'm trying to think of a good example of a card that looks kind of weird but ended up being very good. Um, if you have a card that that looks like, I mean, I, I, this this example might sound ludicrous, but if you weren't there, you, you actually didn't know. When Umazawa's GTA came out, it was really hard to parse what this card even did. And mm. I opened it. Because it was so complicated. Yes, Umazawa's GTA, for those who don't know, is my pick for the best limited card of all time. But it's also a really weird and confusing card, especially if you're just reading it. I opened this card at my pre-release, and after one game, I concluded this was the best card I'd ever seen. I didn't need any more data, mm -hmm. and I still don't think mm -hmm. that I needed more data. Like, I, I did get a lot more data. I got a chance to play with it and see how it played in limited, you know, for that whole next year. And yes, it was still busted, the best card ever. So I, I, I'm going to disagree with a little of how you frame that. I'm just, I just want to make clear that when we talk about results, we don't talk about like this, this card, the deck came together to support this card, and I won the draft, so this is good. That's bad data. It can be fine data mm -hmm. to be like, yeah, I drafted this Gin of Wishes and it was insane every game because it's like, yeah, you know, you, you look at a card and just see how it plays out. And sometimes you can get really – you don't need a whole lot more than that, right? You, you, you can just mm – -hmm. you can just – like Sarkin's Unsealing is a good example. The first yeah. time I, the yeah, first time I put example. this in a deck, I was like, wow, this card's insane. And then I thought to myself, maybe just my deck was too good enough – good – happened to be good for this. And then you just look at the common creatures in like – red and green and you're just like no this card's insane <laughs> yeah there's a lot yeah, of you, there's a lot just of tons yeah. of bristling boars and colossal dread maws and onaki ogres and, and havoc devils and whatnot right and and, and i mean look m m my point was that if you are basing your information off of these small sample sizes that you've done and just assuming that they're correct then you're doing it wrong this data is not reliable or useful you have to do the thing that luis just did which is 
take the extra step to figure out why it is you're doing what you're doing and, and why you think the things that you think. And this is the hard part because you, you know, you might be wrong or, you know, you, you might be overvaluing those situations. And this is what we're going to try to warn ba you away from. Yeah, doing, ba basically you, know, you need to, you, and this is the hard part. And this is what we're going to try to help you do is you need to blend the actual results of what happened, not the win loss results, but the effect these cards had on the game or the way this deck played out in a draft with mm -hmm. your intuition and knowledge about magic and your your ability to make projections about what will happen in the future. Another card, I, just thought, I thought of another really good card to talk about. It's mm -hmm. Death Cloud. It's X, black, 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 sorcery. Each player discards X, X cards, sacrifices X lands, sacrifices X creatures, and loses X life. How good do you think this card is in Limited? Ouch. Well, it sounds pretty bad. Yeah, it does sound bad. Because you're spending a card and it's, it's what's it called, uh, symmetrical? Right. This card is insane. It's it it, it oh. it's absurdly good because what it, what it does is you end up spending let's say six or seven mana, and it's not exactly symmetrical because you know it's coming. You build your deck with fewer creatures. You if this is Mirrodin, you could build your deck with a bunch of artifacts that it doesn't affect, and all of a sudden both players have no creatures in play, no cards in hand, and very few lands in play. But you were able to, to hide a resource or two among your artifacts or among enchantments or whatever. Oh, interesting. And Death Cloud is, is the kind of card that's really rewarding and really powerful, but you have to like look at how does this card play out? How does it work? What do I need to do to maximize it? But the power level is there. And you don't need a ton of results to mm -hmm. actually have played it, but it's also the kind of card uh, where you would not pick and play this card with high stakes on the line if you'd never done it before because like this card is just so weird. And yeah, what we're yeah. going to try to Very difficult to evaluate. give you the, the tools for is how to figure that out and how to figure out when this, you know, this, the mill deck is an actual thing or just a thing Marshall likes to draft because it's fun. Because, <laughs> I mean, we, we like talking about what's fun for us. But again, at our core, we want to give you the tools to, to achieve your goals in Magic. And that may be winning more, maybe trying to solve a limited format and maybe having fun. It's all those things. But we're right. not going to try to tell you that mill deck is good when it's not good. We really don't want to do that. Um, Right. As a side as, as and, a side note, I drafted mm -hmm. Death Cloud at my first Pro Tour, and it was really good. <laughs> but I would not have. And, and you knew, but you but you knew it was I good. Did, before I had you done took a lot or? of practice in that format, and I knew it was good. And okay. I got it really late. Yeah. I think other people at my table didn't, and that's like exactly the kind of edge. Harder to get these days because, like Marshall said earlier, you get a ton of information off a lot of different sources, and there's a whole lineup of people who love to tell you what's underrated, you know, in case you missed it, us included. So <laughs> there, there, there was no one like that, you know, 14 years ago. And a yeah. month after the set comes out, I have Death Cloud, you know, in, in my back pocket, metaphorically, very clear. It's, it's Hall of Fame right. voting season. I want to be very clear that, <laughs> that this is a metaphor. Uh, Noted. <laughs> and I, I knew it was good. And then I got one seventh pick or sixth pick or whatever. And it was like, yeah, this is, you know, my, my great practice paying off. So. Right. Okay, so you know, to zoom out here, we're talking about how much data you can actually get out of Magic, and the answer is not that much. Uh, it's just the sample sizes aren't there for you to take, you know, hard conclusions. But what do you get out of play testing or just playing uh, if the raw data itself isn't super useful because of how well, limited it is? Let's talk about the yeah, things that you do it, get out of it because you do get a lot well, out of it. And here, here's the tricky part, and here's why I think podcast and stream lend themselves a lot better to this format. Uh, in, in terms of explaining them. And, and this is why I put a high value on like communication, like in, in teams, instead of just posting spreadsheets is that the data mm -hmm. that's interesting. And you're about to lay this out uh, is not something that's easily translatable, especially by numbers. And I'm very wary uh, when people try to do that. And our team has tried to do that. This is trial. You know, this is, this is my experience with it. This isn't me just theorizing. And okay. What you're trying to get out of it is a lot of the stuff that you observe in the game and can, you can talk about it. Like we're going to talk about it right now when you're, when you watch someone stream and they say like, well, here's why I don't like this card or here's why I like this card. And then you can watch them play the games with the card. You get that in same information. But what you're trying to get out of this is just is not analytics. Analytics is, you know, a really super powerful tool, you know, or, or way of, way of, uh, sorting data. Doing analytics on magic matches in order to figure out what's good is, very difficult. And uh, what, well, what do we get out of this? Yeah. And so, you know, because again, I think that it's useful not just for us to say, well, this isn't 
you know, that's not something you should pay attention to. I think the natural follow up question is, well, what should I, or what do I get out of it? So for example, uh, when you play, even if you only get to play the card once, you still get to see how the actual cards interact and play out in a game setting, right? Some cards are hard to evaluate or they shine in certain settings or whatever. And that isn't always apparent at first glance. And Luis gave us a few really good examples of that. So you get to see that. That's really important. You get familiarized with the combat tricks and instant speed removal spells for each color. Look, how many times, you know, during the course of an average match of magic, are you forced to play around something or to consider the uh, possibility that your opponent could interact during combat? It happens all the time. And the fact is, is that you're a human being and you need to learn these things, right? And every new set gives us a whole new thing of, oh, there's a white one and a white plus two plus two. And there's this other one that gives indestructible. And you need to, to have those all marked down. If I attack and I go, if my opponent says attack me with this creature and I double block and they have four mana up in both red and black, are there any instant speed removal spells that can interact with the creatures that I have? Well, these are things that you need to learn and you get these by by actually playing. And sample size doesn't matter for that. It's just a matter of uh, solidifying it in your brain. Um, you also get a chance to do something that's really, really important to this process. And I think that this is actually the meat of what you are trying to hone, the skill that you're trying to hone, which is applying your own learned skills, logic, critical thinking, and experience to these problems, Right. This is a huge skill set to have if you're going to be a high level magic player, because frankly, at least w when it comes to like not actually the skill of playing the games and stuff, this is probably the thing that is the most important. Because when you come down to sit down and do a draft, you have an idea of what cards you think are good, what form, what archetypes are good, what color pairs and all that kind of stuff. And the more right you are, the more you're going to win. I mean, this is going to affect your bottom line in the most direct way possible. And this is your chance to apply all of those things together, the critical thinking, the logic, the experience, everything at once. Because humans are pretty good at seeing patterns. Too good, actually. You know, like, <laughs> it, yeah, you, Our, our exactly. minds tend to create patterns that aren't even there. Right. And that obviously <laughs> can be a problem. And, you know, a discerning eye can see a pattern forming and know where it's going before it even comes to a natural conclusion. Right. Uh, you know, something like like an example that, that I, I had talked to Luis earlier today about before we were recording was I was playing a match where I was playing against my friend Adam and we had two decks that were very similar in speed and ability to put out bombs and deal with them and all of these things. This is a sealed deck, by the way. But the difference was is that my deck had two copies of Arcane Encyclopedia, which lets you draw an extra card every turn in the late game. And I was able to look at that and A, change my game plan uh, through sideboarding, but also just determine how the matchup would likely go based on the fact that I had these two tools. He had no answers to them. I asked him after in, in his pool. And if things went about one for one, one for one, one for one, I would eventually win the game because I could start drawing a bunch of extra cards. I didn't need to play 744 matches or 2,500 matches with these decks to understand that that gave me a significant advantage. Now, could I tell you what the numbers are? No. And I, I don't know. I just don't. I don't know if it's an 80% or a 55%. I don't know the answer to that question, and I won't. But the truth is, is that me understanding that these are the types of cards that matter in these type of matchups is a big takeaway, right? If I'm trying to learn the sealed format and I can understand, okay, this Ar Arcane Encyclopedia, which given that M19 has been out for a while and I've known that I like that card a lot, but if it was week one and I just dominated him by using this card, that would be a significant data point for me saying, okay, here's a place where this card truly shined. Now, I'm not going to mark it up. This is this is a difference, by the way. I think that hastier players will say, that card's awesome. Done. Book it. It goes in the awesome column of my card evaluation thing, and I'm done with it. That That is the part that screws you up because you have taken the sample size of one matchup, one type of matchup, and you've applied it to all matchups. And that doesn't work well uh, because, as you would see, if I ended up playing against like a fast red-white deck or something like that, I would be valuing my Arcane Encyclopedia lower than I do against the similarly speeded grindy game. So basically what we're trying to do is uh, if you're able to do a good job of evaluating things, it's kind of like a force multiplier, right? Like it, you could you hmm. could move a lot of, a lot of uh, rocks from one side of your garden to the other, but it would be a lot faster if you had a wheelbarrow <laughs> and a mm -hmm. shovel. So uh, what right. we're trying to do is 
basically, you know, give you a wheelbarrow and a shovel. That's the whole goal of our podcast. Uh, I think you'll be mailing <laughs> one of those out at, at next week. Yeah, be- yeah. Because, I mean, the, the truth is, you know, pro magic players don't play as much magic as you think they do. They do not. But they're able mm-hmm. to draw good conclusions off of the magic they do play. And a lot of them do play a lot of magic. I'm not saying I have not spent weeks where I've played tons of magic. But, you know, if you look at a lot of what pro players do, I think people conflate playing a lot of magic with uh, – being able to be good, like playing a lot of magic means you're going to be good at something. And it's and to be good at this, it requires you play a lot. And it's not exactly like that simple. If you look at, uh, you know, like we've spoken before about how Paulo Vitor, uh, but he's like, what, you know, third best player of all time, maybe he plays no magic in between pro tours, but he's very good at synthesizing the data he gets when he does start playing again. And mm-hmm. he's a great example of this, by the way, maybe one of the best. And, we, you know, it's not, and again, everyone's goal isn't to be exactly the best they can, but you do want to use your, your time wisely, right? You do want to, you, you do, and you do want to reach conclusions because if you're not going to draft a set 50 times, which a lot of you listeners are not going to, it would be nice if they could draft a set a couple of times and then be pretty confident going into their fifth draft that they have learned a lot from their first four drafts, even though it's not tons of games. And so right. w- one of the biggest differences, uh, is, you know, being being able to pay attention to what happens in a game versus the results of the game. And that's kind of what we've been talking about. I think my favorite example of this is when uh, Owen went 15-0 with hardened scales as a deck in standard, decided the deck wasn't good. Uh, he went 15-0 on, on Magic Online, decided the deck wasn't good and played Rally the Ancestors and then won the Grand Prix that he played in with Rally. That is insane. And a lot of people just don't have that discipline. They don't have the, you know, the... They they go you know they go fifteen zero with a deck and they're going to be convinced the deck is great. Owen said like yeah I right. won all my matches but it felt like I was getting lucky in a bunch of spots. Uh, I felt like a lot of the common matchups weren't actually that good. My opponents mulliganed a bunch. I just didn't think the deck was that good. And mm-hmm. that's perfect testing. You're able to separate those two things out. So some of the pitfalls that uh, people do kind of fall into here is you know what we spoke about earlier overvaluing a small or non-existent sample size. It, it, we're never we're never going to get there on sample sizes. Don't, don't look right. don't look at that. And I think the worst thing people can do <laughs> is say like, yeah, I don't want a small sample size, so I'm going to play 30 games instead of 10. And it's like, yeah, that does not change. <laughs> that that should right. not that should not but, move but the, the needle as much as you think it does. Right, and this is what Frank, yeah. you know, helped us understand yeah. more is that it wasn't just that you were close to getting a reasonable sample size; you were actually, you know, quite far off. Um, one of the things we all speak against is best case scenario mentality because uh, people tend to evaluate cards or decks in the best case scenario, and you, you, it's really easy to say, like, yeah, you know, of course, <laughs> of course, this card is going to be great because look at the situations where it's great, and then you don't look at what is the average situation because that's a lot more. Yeah, I th- think about how much weight comes the comes down on the first time you get to play with. Yeah, the card. and that and that's what's that's it's what's tough about this is weighted. if it's a rare, you might only get to play with it once. So <laughs> it's not like yeah. and, you and, don't get and, a chance to rectify right. that, right? You you don't get a right. chance to go back and be like, oh, my first time was actually I actually got a little lucky, and it wasn't actually as good as I thought. But this is you know I ended up here because uh, because I just happened to hit a draft where this card is really good. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I want to say before we go through the rest of the pitfalls is just a, a sort of a big picture view on this whole thing, which is magic is more art than science. And the the way the reason I say that is because if you told me that a deck was good and I said prove it, you couldn't. Right? You you could certainly give me some logic behind it that made sense, but you couldn't show me realistically, right? Like saying Here's the, you know, here's the numbers that I have for Magic Online or here, you know, maybe they could because they actually have sample sizes that could work. But you couldn't, we couldn't generate that ourselves in any realistic scenario. So what it comes down to instead is logic, is understanding it. It is, it is the nuance to this stuff. And that's what we're, that's what we're getting into now. What, what about the next uh, pitfall? Uh, this is one that we, we always fight against. It's really tough as well as confirmation bias. And when you come into a, a draft or a, a match or a testing session or any of those things with a belief or opinion you want to confirm, you tend to overvalue yeah. evidence that does confirm that. And I fall in, I fall into this trap a lot. And I, I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember trying to argue like that control was good in a format and Ben was just like, 
you want control to be good. So when you draft a control deck that's good, you say that it was good. And when it's bad, you you know you you look for reasons why that this wasn't representative. And it was just like, yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. I'm doing that. That that is really bad. A bad idea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th- that is one of the toughest ones. And it comes up in magic all the time, especially because I think a lot of us have that little streak in us about wanting to, what is it? Be clever. I, you know, win, win with bad cards or find a new thing, right? Like w- what is it about our psychological makeup that makes us want to say, Hey, friend who plays magic also, I think I broke it. The the mill deck is real in M nineteen. So I, I, I right. What, what what is that that makes me you know that makes you want to be like I found something new and exciting and and, and draws us to that. I don't well, know, but I feel like a lot of people have. I mean, there's a couple things going on. One is in the situation you're talking about, people want to be uh, the person who discovered something or made or found something good. Yeah. Uh, another yeah. another important part is people believe tend to believe themselves. So when you have come up with an mm-hmm. idea, you will believe yourself and think that idea is good. You want to believe yourself. You 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 overvalue your own opinion. And people, that's just how your our egocentric minds work. You you come up with a theory mm-hmm. or an idea, and you're like, "Wow, I'm really clever." And then you look for evidence mm-hmm. as to why that idea is good. <laughs> uh, right. See a lot okay. of this in, in, in yeah, Hall of Fame because I, I do. Feel- <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, but you know, I, I just I, I find that to be something that comes up a lot, the confirmation bias, because if you build a deck or if you discover an archetype, you feel incentivized for whatever reason to to push for it as being good, even if, like you said, you haven't really recognized it. And that that is confirmation bias coming out full, full form. Um, and then uh, lastly, it is that uh, the the notion that because one one type of card has always been bad, it will continue to be bad. You, you, you aim... Uh, a little bit too or lean a little bit too much on previous experiences. And this is an example of a heuristic, I think, because uh, people, you try to u- use information they already have and it's usually very useful, right? Like you, you mentioned lightning strike and how lightning strike is mm-hmm. always been good and will always continue to be good. And that is like 99% true. You, you could probably make up a limited format where lightning strike isn't good, but it would look really weird. Mm-hmm. So, so then when mm-hmm. you have a card that looks a lot like previous bad cards, uh, you end up undervaluing or overvaluing the, or undervaluing the card if it looks like bad cards or, or, or overvaluing it if it looks like a good card. Uh, a great example of this is the card Lust for War. This card's two in a red. Mm-hmm. It's an enchantment. Uh, it was in Rise of the Eldrazi. And it says, Enchanted creature must attack each turn. When Enchanted creature becomes tapped, it deals three damage to its opponent. Or Lust for War does. I don't remember mm-hmm. which one does the damage, but whatever. To, to its controller. Oh, sorry, to its controller is what I meant. So basically, yeah. you put it on mm-hmm. your opponent's creature and they take three every single turn. Um, as well as being forced to attack their creature. This card was not valued highly when it first came out. People no. looked at this card and thought, wow, this card this card sucks. Uh, and part of the reason is that Red has had a lot of really weird must-attack, can't-block type enchantments over the course of the years, and they were all just horrible. <laughs> none, none of them did anything. Mm-hmm. So then Lust for War comes out, and it just looks so much like that. Our, our lazy, lazy brains shortcut it in, 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 into, yep. thinking, into thinking that... <laughs> Yeah, this card is bad. And it, as it turns out, uh, the card was great. I think that card is fantastic. So it was really good. Yeah. So you end up in a you you would end up in a spot where if you if you shortcutted, which almost everyone did, then you looked over one of the cards, which I think was like a windmill slam first pick. I think that card is amazing. It's basically three mana, unblockable haste, uh, three power creature with you know with hexproof because in order to kill it, they'd have to kill their own creature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it even gave you the opportunity to to block it if you needed to as well, like if you couldn't right. and give you a, a so, block that they didn't want to so give yeah, you. So yeah, it, it's a really powerful tool. Look at us in the set reviews. We do this all the time. And if you charted out our, our misses, as rare as they may be, um, the, the, the last set review had more misses, <laughs> I thought, uh, than, than average. Um, <laughs> no, we crushed it. We killed that. Uh, if, if, you, if you looked at, back at our misses, I, I bet a high percentage of them will be cards that look similar to previous bad cards. Because, I mean, mm. th- that it is a yeah. useful tool, but you have to understand that, that this is what's going on and eval- evaluate with that in mind. So I, I think it's a, it's both a useful tool to evaluate using cards that uh, you know are, have – have examples previously, but you also have to be aware of this inherent bias towards cards that uh, that w- were were bad and cards that look like those cards. 
Yeah, there's a lot of examples of yeah. those uh, out there because, you know, we do see a lot of patterns uh, from set to set where you'll see similarly designed cards with the mana cost or the benefits or whatever tweaked here and there. You know, think of a fight card. How many different versions of yeah. fighting have we seen, you know, in green, that kind and, of stuff. The, you know, weird ones like the blue gives something minus power until end of turn cards, like that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. And, and I think like uncomfortable chills getting hit by that a little bit Be because yeah, most of those cards suck, but uncomfortable chills pretty good. So it's be it's not a great card, but it's better than most people think, and that that is because it looks like a lot of bad cards. Uh, yeah. So, totally. okay. So let's talk. So so those are some of the things, the pitfalls, right? Those are some of the traps that you can fall into. Uh, you know, as somebody who's trying to figure these things out using again the skill set that you've developed over the time of thinking about the cards and 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 your experience and intuition and all that stuff. Well, what are the some of the things that maybe like a professional level player might be doing? that uh, average listener isn't doing right now. So well, I'm going to go through these examples and then also try to figure out the best ways for those pe for the, our listeners to do them. Because I, look, I, I'm aware that, uh, you know, you, you, the average listener can't text Ben and ask what he thinks about a draft pick. But I mm -hmm. will put this out, actually, speaking of Ben, the average listener can send Ben a tweet at, with that and he probably will respond. So I, I'm not saying – harass all your your favorite pros on Twitter. But honestly, if you ask a good question and one especially that can be answered without like a, you know, five tweets or whatever, you, you'll you get a very high hit rate in terms of responses. Like, I don't know. Yeah. How would you build this sealed boot pool does no, not no, count? That, that, that one you're not going to get a high hit rate on. But if you, if you, people love uh, what's the picks. And if, if you, if you oh, send yeah. like the average pro you know, who, who you think, you know, is good and talks and knows about limited, a tweet saying, Hey, what would you pick out of this pack? You're probably going to get a response. So, and agree, th yeah. they'll enjoy doing it. So I, I think that there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, so that kind of segues into the first one, which is, you know, we spend a lot of time talking with our network about how a format works, what's good, what, what, what's not, you know, whether it be our testing team, whether it just be people we know and Everyone can do this. Almost everyone has people they can talk to. And even if they're not literally like someone who they're hanging out with or seeing, right? You don't, maybe you don't have like a local play group. You still have Twitter, like I, in the way I just mentioned. You can still look at like the tweets that like a lot of, uh, a lot of people or websites will tweet like, Hey, what would you pick out of this pack? And those threads tend to be long or you put them, post them on Facebook or in the LRCast subreddit or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. so you, this this is really important though. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, I've seen the the in the professional testing. Like, look, we were talking about sample sizes earlier. Well, you know, especially given the time frame that pros get before the pro tour, but even after, well, it's just really hard for one person to have a good grasp on all the different facets of a limited oh. environment. And so you're going to have to trust and, other and people around you, especially when it comes to well. rares. R rares are the oh, biggest. Yeah. Uh, so what you'll see very frequently in our test groups is some people posting screenshots of drafts and saying, "Hey, what would you pick here?" It doesn't even always need to be pick one, pack one. In fact, one of the big values is, hey, it's pick two, pack one. I'm like red, black, but I opened a really good blue card. Would you switch to blue here? Or I'm or I'm red, black, and I opened a good red card and a good black card. Which would you take and why? And asking other people to get their, their take on it is really good. It can also really leverage, you know, other people's experiences in a way that's positive for you. So a, a good example of mm -hmm. that is you open a you, – you've got to like – black white deck and you open a really good black uncommon and a white rare you haven't played with that could be good or not. So one way to to do things is to just take the rare which we we tend to advise that because you you have fewer chances to play with it. But another useful thing is to is to also screenshot it and post it and ask someone and see what they say and especially if there are people it, you'll get people who've played with that rare before who can say that especially if there are yeah. people who have take who would have taken the opposite card that you did. They can speak to that card because you don't get to go back and then rerun the draft with the opposite decision, right? You took the white rare, but it turns out the black uncommon is actually really, really good. And you don't get to go back and take the black uncommon and see how it ends up. But you can ask other people and they can tell you why they would do what they did. And maybe you'll do something differently in the future as a result. Yeah. That can also reveal big gaps, yes. right? Where you're like, oh, I think I'm going to take this card. And somebody goes no like what are you doing you you know like m m for example let's say uh, somebody early in the format got a chance to play with patient rebuilding or was extremely clever like we were and saw ahead of time that that card was going to be flat out awesome and they said oh well here's my pack one pick one it has electrify 
but there's also patient rebuilding. I'm going to take the electrify. Right. You, right? you, you might not you might know. say like, oh, stop. Right. Yeah. yeah. You might be unaware you know. that you're making an egregious error at that point. <laughs> right. And and that's and that's it though. Right. I mean, that's really important because if you haven't had experience with it, but your friend or testing partner, whoever has, they can sit, tell you not only would I not take electrify, it's not close, right? Like th there's a major gap in your in your logic here, and it's you know it's fine. It's just probably because you haven't played with it yet. But this is a spot where now you're up to speed, boom, just like that. Where boy, especially if you didn't take that card and you just took the electrify, you might not know by the time you got to the tournament you were testing for that that card was uh, was really really good because those cards are hard to evaluate. They're very weird looking on the surface. Plus, you know what's great about all this. Is it's fun to talk about magic? <laughs> yeah, that that is very. There's a reason true. this stuff works, and yes. You, yes. You, you know, there's a reason that part of the reason that we do a lot of uh, discussion around what's the pick or what's the play stuff is because people like doing that, and that is easier to get people into conversation than. Honestly, they have a higher hit rate than what do people think the fundamentals of the format are? You're just not going to get as many responses if you ask questions like that. Right. Yeah, um, this is much more granular. And you right. do need to kind of go through all these things. Um, so an another thing that I think is is important is uh, seeing edge cases and good spots for cards without casting them. Uh, theory crafting mm -hmm. is, is, is what we call it. Honestly, theory crafting sounds like an excuse to not do work. It really does. Uh, Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I even told you about theory crafting. That's, I think, what you heard. <laughs> I think I laughed. Yeah. yeah. I, I've actually come around on it quite a oh, bit. Theory though, crafting after is great. Like, be yeah. Because what, what you want you want to be able to do is try to understand as much as you can. I mean, this is what we do in set reviews. And we we then get data and we then adjust and we then tend to talk about the the, the misses and the hits or what have you. And uh, – but before that, you you don't have that information. You have to you have to be able to evaluate cards without playing with them. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing which <laughs> will serve you well in all all facets of life is being willing to admit that you were wrong. People yes. tend to to dig in their heels, and there there are especially and this is the downside of, of trying to communicate online versus in person, where it, it obviously happens much more frequently online, where people just get into an argument and no one ever will ever back down. But being able to, re to challenge your own conclusions to, to start to think like, hey, I might have been wrong about that is really important because if, if you come out the gates and you win two drafts with like red, blue aggro and then people are like, you know, that deck's not very good. You have to be willing to change your mind if you get the data that indicates you should. Right. And it, the thing is, is that this goes back to what you were talking about too. Like your story that you gave about, you know, and as an example, you saying, oh, this control is really good in this format and Ben saying it's not. And you're, you know, exhibiting a lot of confirmation bias to try to prove that the thing that you want to be true is true. Boy, I mean, even just you telling that story, I was like, wow, that would be really tough in the moment to say, you know what, Ben, you're absolutely right. I was wrong about that. And I've been doing this wrong. Thanks for pointing that out. Like, it's just like, oh, you know, you, you, you kind of people tend to kind of plant their flag on a hill and it's like can be pretty tough to get you to, to come off of it, you know, and that is a skill. It is. And I think most people, you know, tend to do it in time, like maybe in the moment they won't be able to do it, but after some reflection or something like that. But, you know, the better you get at that when faced with, you know, really good information, the 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 quicker you be, you'll be able to sort of set that behind you and, and move on to the next thing. So kind of what, what do we expect people to get out of this? Like what, what is the what is the goal of of kind of what we've talked about today? The The goal really is you should be able to apply the information you get from a draft or from watching drafts or from talking about drafts to the future without being without without putting too much stock into the information as well and it's a really tricky balance to strike but it is it is very rewarding and so looking at kind of like what fundamentally goes on in games of magic what how how certain cards perform comparing them to past cards while knowing that they uh there, there are just different you know the, the different environments favor different things mm -hmm. trying to synthesize all of that it, it is very difficult and yes. i i i guess the, the the best way to go about it is i'm always a, an advocate for discussing more and trying to get look at other viewpoints other than your own um and trying to understand what it is you're trying to get out of uh, each draft like you you don't need to learn whether doomblade or lightning strike or electrify is good because those those cards you know what will do what they say and tend to be tend to be pretty mm -hmm. good 
when it is useful is when you draft an archetype, let's say you haven't drafted before, try to separate out your winning or losing from that and try to figure out what, what it was doing in the games that was good. If you look at a red-white aggro deck and you say like, you know, the fact that you have Star Crown Stag and Pegasus Courser means blocking is really difficult. You have a really powerful, uncommon, and heroic reinforcement. So I think Red White is a, has the support it needs here. Or you look at a you, or you draft a different deck, like you know, and Black White, and you're like, well, this Black White Aggro deck came together, but I actually don't think Black White Aggro is going to work in this format. Right. It was based on a bunch of uncommons enough, or something. Yeah. Right. It doesn't have enough good aggressive creatures. Another good example is the black red sacrifice deck from reading the card file, you could think that there's something there and it did look like it might be there. Mm -hmm. But once you play it out, it just, it turns out that it it doesn't come together often enough. There's not enough of the enablers and you don't need to draft it 50 times to know that, but you also would like to draft it more than just once to know that. And looking at kind of what's present in, in the, in the card file is really useful towards doing that. Yes. Especially when backed up by by games you play. Right. I think that one of the really useful concepts for communicating in these ways is, and I hear, uh, by the way, professional players use this a lot, is what's your confidence level? Right? Like you you might come in and say something like, okay, guys, I, I think that the red black, sac- red black Sacrifice deck might be a thing in this format because I'm seeing that on the Gold Uncommon and then there's also Active Treason and a few cards that I've noticed that have me sacrifice. So it's something that I think might be playable in this format. And somebody could say, well, what's your degree of confidence at this point? And you could probably say 25%, right? Like it's just, uh, I've, I see some breadcrumbs here and I want to see where they go. Then you could draft it a few times. And remember, you also get to double up when people play it against you. You get to understand how it's working on the other side too. So that's kind of useful information. And maybe you do come to the conclusion that, you know, the enablers are uncommon in this and I don't really see a big payoff and they're not even that good on their own. And ultimately you decide it's not that great. So maybe two weeks later, you have the same chat with the friend and you say, okay, I've got some updates on the red black sacrifice deck i don't think it's as good i don't think it's going to be a real archetype given these circumstances it could be good but those are narrow and don't come up often and aren't worth going for so i think it's not that good well what's your degree of confidence you could say 80 percent. like i'm I'm pretty sure that this deck just isn't a real thing and by the time we hang up m19 we're not going to look back and go oh wow you know remember that red black sacrifice deck in in m19 that was a real deal this is really useful because you need to be able to put things on the table, but also let people know what, what, to what degree of certainty you have with these. And, and that's something that I see people not do a lot where somebody says, hey, the Red Black Sacrifice deck might be a real thing. And all of a sudden, you're the champion of this deck who's sitting there saying that it's good. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I need to be able to put this on the table without it being that it's my deck or that I care about it on some personal level or something like that. So that's something that I see a lot with the pros. As far as the broader conclusions go, you know, the way I see it is that in in today's magic world, you have a ton of information and data available to you. This is generally a very good thing, but if you don't have the skill set to decipher which data is useful and which is uh, probably better ignored, it can be both overwhelming and even counterproductive to try to use all of it. Uh, even when we have some numbers, we have to recognize that magic is far from being solved as a game. I mean, really far away. And that the majority of what we learn and decode is uh, from the information we do have is going to be based on experience, logic, critical thinking, and intuition. Gathering data is a good thing, but only if it's used properly and within the context that it can be helpful in. You know, imagine winning two drafts with a given color pair and just deciding it's the best color pair in the set. The sample size is absurdly low uh, that you would need to make that kind of conclusion. And it doesn't really, you know, have any weight behind it to make that kind of conclusion. You need to have reasoning that is sound behind it to make that conclusion, which you absolutely can. Uh, Perhaps winning the two drafts was simply an entry point to you looking closer at how this color pair performs. The key is to know which pieces of information to value highly and which to take with a grain of salt. And think if you can work on the skill set that we laid out, you're going to be able to improve your win rate in a meaningful way. And if you don't, sure, you can just take all this stuff and just use it for fun conversation pieces too. It's not like it's like, you know, super harmful unless you put a whole lot of weight on it. Basically, I think the takeaway is that magic is really hard and there's a temptation to to want to overuse data and numbers when really yeah. playing and trying to figure out what is effective and what is not and how the games went is 
we haven't found a good substitute for that right now. Yep. Like, yep. I, 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 I wish there was one, you know, and we, the best we can do is we can try to, you know, give you what, what happens in our experiences and what we get from talking to other people. But there's really no substitute for uh, explaining out data, explaining out our experiences and explaining what happens and why those might happen. It, it just There's not a lot of like win rate and number based things that are really going to help you help you get better at limited. So I think that, uh, you know, healthy discussion is really important. I think, you know, listening to the podcast is, is in getting information. Hopefully we're a reliable source. We certainly try to be. Uh -huh. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> but, you know, w w watching streams, uh, I, again, I, I encourage people to converse on Twitter. I think that that's, a, that's the, my favorite part of that, uh, of what that, the website provides, what Twitter provides, is that you can talk to people you would otherwise not be able to talk to. And in a lot of cases, they're very receptive to that. Yeah, so sure. I, I would encourage you to 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 kind of do what you can to get good information and good data from other people and be very wary of trying to, I guess, you know, extract analytics or numbers that are just they're really I wish they were helpful. They just they're just not. Yeah. Maybe one day, you know, maybe one day. And we'll do a show about that when it comes out, if we can get a whole slew of really useful nitty gritty numbers. But for now, you're going to have to use your brain. That's yeah, just, just, tweet, just tell Ben that, uh, you know, just tweet it, tweet it, Ben and tell, tell him that we sent you. I know, no jokes. Ben. He will, he, 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 he will be happy to do this. He, he actually does. I mean, Ben as, genuinely as will loves we, this stuff. As will we, by the way, yes, we certainly don't yes, mind. I mean, yes. this is part of what we can offer, isn't it? And part of what I think is cool about how all this stuff works. Absolutely. All right. That's going to do it for this one. Thanks so much for hanging out for our latest level up show. If you uh, want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. Uh, I want to remind you that the show is brought to you by channelfireball.com, the place to go for everything you need magic related on the internet, including free content, sealed single product, uh, singles, sealed product. And of course, if you want to trade your cards in for store credit, they will give you a 30% bonus. That is hefty and well worth the effort of sending in your cards. So make sure you do that if you've got that pile of rares sitting there. Um, we're going to be back next week, uh, just ahead of, of GP Richmond, probably a little bit earlier in the week. And uh, that's going to do it for this one. We'll see you then. Okay, Louise. So I met a friend of ours at uh, GPLA named James. And uh, James, he, he gave me $5.00 as a donation to the show. Now, James was only 13 years old. And so that was a very touching thing for, for him to do, because as you can imagine, when you're 13, five bucks goes a long way. And I decided that I asked James, well, what, what, what should we do with this? Cause I felt, you know, I was like, come on, like, you know, you don't got to give me your five bucks, but I'm, he really wanted to support the show and I wasn't going to say no. So what I, what he wanted was he wanted to do a Let's Stump Vargas with a Kamigawa pack. And so I've bought a pack of Saviors of Kamigawa, and we are going to do an LSV. Right I, now. I, I will say that uh, Marshall suggested Let's Stump Vargas, and I'm like, I don't know. I, I think that those are good competitions, but but one-on-one, -on -one, you know, or, or just by myself, I, I'd rather move away from that. And he said I had to do this one. So yeah, this is so. this is under deep protest. I'm going to flub all the answers in response. <laughs> I, I feel like in order to pay back James for his generous donation, you have to go perfect on this. This is you also, also your favorite to, block, right? I, I believe, you know, as the terms of our agreement, you need to PayPal me 2250 at this point. <laughs> I already spent it on the pack, man. It's gone. Okay. Um, you know this set pretty well, right? Oh yeah, this is is this the second or the third set? Saviors is the one I probably know the least well. Uh, okay. It's the third one, but you know because the third sets are always the worst. But uh, <laughs> and the smallest, and you, you uh, yeah, see I'll them take a least. stab at it. Okay, uh, here we go. This first one is called Elder Pine of Jukai. Oh yeah, this card was, was pretty sweet. This is a two in a green for mm -hmm. like a two two one. Yep, that's right. Whenever you play a spirit or a cane spell, you like look at the top three cards of your deck and put all lands in your hand from them. Yep, that's exactly what it does. I think it has soul shift two also. It does. You are insane. That is so much rules text on that card. Well, this this was actually one of the better draft cards because spirit and arcane were, were okay. part of the. Part I mean, of the I've theme. never seen this card in my life, and I'm just like, uh, there's no way he's going to get this. Like, it has a. <laughs> Br a brick of it also a soul shift two at the end. This is this is not a common, by the way, for for those of the game design inclination. <laughs> I was going to say this, this is, is a common. common, but this is not a common. All right. Yeah, it um, is. A, it is literally a common, but it should not be. Yes. Uh, next is sink into Takanuma. 
Uh, so it's three and a black. It has a sweep, I think is the name. It is. I um, don't even know what sweep does. You, 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 did, you get to return as, as many swamps as you want while casting this, and your mm-hmm. opponent discards that many cards. Yeah, you are right. Uh, Kitsune Dawnblade. Uh, this one, I believe, is four and a white for a 2-3 Bushido one, and it says uh, enter the battlefield, tap target creature. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> Boy, these, this is hard mode, man. That's a lot of rules text for yeah, a common. Yeah, so Savior's... Too. Yeah, Savior's had a lot of text on his cards. Yeah, this one uh, also has a lot of text. It's called Sokenzan Spellblade. Sokenzan Spellblade. Oh, is, sorry. Uh, Sokenzan Spellblade. Four in a red for a 2-3, and you can pay one in a red. I think it gets plus one, plus zero oh for each card in your opponent's hand. Uh, so, in, in your hand. Like that. In your hand. Oh, in your hand. Sorry. You, you're getting that, but it does have one other ability. It has Menace, I think. Or, wait, no, no, no. Mountain Walk? Something like that. It has Bushido 1. Oh, but she didn't win. Yep. All right. Can't get them all. This is a real card. Get it? Hmm? Do you know what it is? Oh, is it freed from the real? <laughs> God, you two, are insane, two, dude. Two, what two, the two hell? A, two in a blue enchant, enchant, an aura in the enchanted creature. It has blue tap it or blue untap it. God, that's exactly right. Uh, <laughs> what the hell, you man? You didn't even have to give me the card I name. I didn't even <laughs> the card name and you got it right. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe maybe I knew Savior's like reasonably well. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Okina Nightwitch. <laughs> this one this one I might be actually breaking on. This is uh oh, I mean it's clearly a black card. I would think <laughs> so too, but it's not. Uh, oh, I, I, I read it wrong. It's night okay. watch. Oh, night watch. Okina okay. Night Watch. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is uh this is a green card. It is. Um, I think this is like ugh, four in a green mm-hmm. for I I think it's like a four three. It is. And it is. <laughs> I want to say plus three, plus three, will you have more cards in hand than your opponent? That's exactly what it is. I okay. even told you the wrong name. <laughs> All right. Oh, this is a cool name. I've never seen this card. It's called Nat Miser. <laughs> oh, the old Nat Miser? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think this is like, I feel like there's uh, some pro that should have this as a nickname, but. Yeah. It, I think this is a spirit for, it's like a, I want to say 01 Flyer for uh, one and a black. And, no, this is a different uh, card. Uh, I'm thinking of a different card. This card is okay. terrible. Yeah, I guess I don't know this one then. Well, maybe it's – so it's black for a 1-1 one, one rat. Mm. And it says each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by one. <laughs> nice. That's Andrew Beckstrom, the old Nat Miser right. himself. Uh, Kitsune Bone Setter. Uh, this is a white card. It's like a fox dude. I think it's a – Yep, yep. It is that. I don't know. This is this is like a three mana two two of some kind of some kind of prevention ability. I don't remember the rest. I'm actually going to give you this one. This one's extraordinarily difficult. It's it's a three mana o one, but it has tap to prevent the next three damage to a delta chart creature this turn. But you can only play the ability if you have more cards in hand than an opponent. That that is just absurd. Oh, by the way, this is going to be my tangent here. Uh, I'm going to complain about Savior's design more because it's fun. Uh, a bit, the the mechanic of having more cards in hand than your opponent is a really bad one because mm. it incentivizes both players to not play their spells. You oh would like God, sometimes right. not play your fourth land because you need to keep more cards in hand. So your oh. Okina night watch or whatever was bigger. Oh my God. And the way they supported that was like cards like was sweep where we could return a bunch of your lands to your hand. Oh, okay. But, th- but that's not like that fun of a mechanic either. And like there'd be weird things like Okina night watch would be a 7-6, they block with a 3-3, three, three, you'd cast a spell and your Night Watch would die because now you had as many cards in your hand as your opponent. So... Ugh. It, it is You just, like this yeah. set? This just feels weird to me. No, I liked I liked the first two. I did not like the third one. Ah, okay, so this is the one you didn't like. Uh, what about yeah. Glitter Fang? Uh, this is red for a 1-1 one, one spirit with haste mm-hmm. and uh, at the end of your turn, return to your hand. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, cut the Earthly Bond. Uh, this is, this is like blue return target spirit. No, blue return target enchanted permanent to its owner's hand. Yeah, that's it. Wait, so is this what I, I'm reading this correctly? Like you return something that is, has an aura on it or something? Yes. You, you can only bounce auras. <laughs> the thing that has the aura on it, right? Yes. Oh my God. It's a little narrow. Uh, promised Kanushi. Promised Kanushi is sweet. This is a, like 
white for a 1-1, one, one, and it has protection from spirits, I think? No, this or, is a different card. Oh, I'm thinking of a different card. Okay. This, I, is, I, I, this is green for a 1-1 one, one with soul shift. Seven. Oh, nice. Yeah. So the, it's the green for a 1-1, one, one, <laughs> and when it dies, you return a spirit that has that costs seven or less to your hand. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> seven? I mean, was there a way to chain it from seven all the way down to, to one oh, or yeah. whatever? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that, that was the fun part about champions. I like that. All right, uncommon. Ivory Crane Netsuki. Mm, this was the one that I think gains you life for... If you have four or more cards in your hand, you gain two life at the start of your turn? This one's actually... Th th this is that card, but the numbers are different. It's actually uh, kind of crazy. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have seven or more cards in hand you gain four life oh okay wow uh shape stealer i don't remember shape stealer blue blue one one whenever mm -hmm. shape stealer blocks or becomes blocked by a creature chain shape stealer's power and toughness to that creature's power and toughness until end of turn that's kind of funny uh what about ayumi the last visitor oh she is sweet she's one of the unique power toughness ratios in uh the entirety of magic. Oh, I, there might be something else that this this the stat line now, but at the time I think she was the only one, or at least one, maybe only one of two. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyways, she's three green green for a seven three with legendary land. Work. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you got a curveball here, buddy. We got a, got foil. a foil. Yeah, Kiku's shadow. Oh, this is black black target creature deals damage uh, deals damage equal to its power to itself. Yep, that is correct. Nice work. Let's see, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, correct, and that should be five. Yeah, you went ten and five. Great work, man. Yeah, I think you did James proud on this one. So nice job. Also, you yeah, guessed yeah. a card without me reading it to you. So yeah, no, that was. <laughs>